Well, it's great seeing how, um, how happy people are to talk to each other. I need to draw everyone back so we can continue with the service, if you don't mind. There'll be plenty of opportunity after the service to continue these conversations over tea and coffee and some lovely biscuits that I spotted quite enviously as I was, I was walking around. Um, so now I'm going to welcome everybody again because the live stream should have just started. So if you're joining us online, you are very, very welcome here this morning. I'm going to hand straight over to musicians. So if you're able, let us stand and sing songs of praise to the Lord our God.
Please take your seats. Jennifer, do you want to come forward? So I thought it would be a good opportunity. Uh, we should take the opportunity to get to know you uh, a little bit. Is that okay? Yeah. So I think we, most of us detected when Jennifer was leading the play for us earlier that her accents might not be considered from Eton Soken. So, <laughs> Jennifer, where, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, I'm an American, um, and I've lived in this country for about 11 years. Um, I am from a Roman Catholic family, uh, but I didn't really fully come to the Lord until about five years ago when my children asked some very, very interesting questions about how in the world can Jesus take the place of Barabbas? Wow. Amazing. It was quite amazing. Yeah. Um, what a story. And they were only three, two, and one at the wow. time. Wow. And they were very interested. Had absolutely no idea how a person who is naughty is getting scot-free. Yeah. He's not being punished, and the innocent one's getting punished. That totally goes against a three-year-old's understanding of the world. Yeah, and how did, oh, that's amazing that, um, that such young children have, have sparked a, a new faith journey for you. So how, how did that impact on your faith journey? How did, how, how did it all come about? Um, well, their questions were far more deeper than I could imagine, and they're children with absolutely no worldly knowledge to taint them. Yeah. Um, and just as Jesus said, let the little children come to me, and that we should approach the kingdom of heaven like a child, I yeah. have fully taken that to heart <laughs> as I've started this journey. That's amazing. So Actios, so that happened about five years ago, and then when, when did you start? I started at Actios you? two years ago, just as schools were sort of coming out of lockdown. Yeah. Um, my church had, just before the lockdown, so in 2019, done a, we were doing a training, and there was a session on parenting, and I said, well, how do you possibly read the Bible to such small children? And they gave me a copy of their beginner's Bible to read to the children, and as we went into lockdown after that, my children wanted me to, them, to read them the Bible every single night, and they just wanted to hear more and more and more and ask questions. And they fell asleep to my best understanding of that. And then I had to read my own Bible to, to go into deeper conversation with them. Yeah, lovely. So what does Actios stand for? It stands for Assisting Christian Teaching in our schools. Yeah, fantastic. So you've been there two years, did you say? Mm -hmm. What changes have been made during that time to Actios? Um, well, there was no worker at the time, so I had no idea what workers did in Actios previously. Um, most of the schools were still shut to visitors, um, but one or two um, opened up their doors, and um, that was Crosshall infants and Crosshall juniors, because they have had such a long-standing relationship with Actios previously, mm. and they didn't seem to mind what kind of the work, what kind of worker it was, they just knew that each one brought a different perspective. Yeah. And they were willing to give me a chance. That's awesome. And we're glad that they did. Yeah. <laughs> How many schools do you go into? Um, this year I've been going into five very regularly, like every week or every other week. Um, but starting in September, for sure there will be seven. 
possibly oh. nine, and over the course of the year, up to 16. Wow. Wow, and it's just you. Yes, it's just me. It's just you. So we definitely need to pray for you uh, before you go. What's, what's the most challenging thing, apart from just being one person with all of these schools, what's the most challenging thing about your job? Um, well, logistically, I don't have enough time yeah. <laughs> to yeah. fit I- everything in. And as much as I would like to go to more schools or go in more often, I obviously can't. Yeah. Um, most schools have their assemblies at 9 o'clock in the morning. And if you only have five days a week, you can't possibly do every school. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, my most, my weakest points are time management. <laughs> yeah, more time. More time. <laughs> And the most encouraging thing about your work? The most encouraging thing is the responses I've had from children and the teachers um, and parents that I come in contact with. Many children see me all over town, as you can imagine. (laughs) And um, they find it, it's nice that they see me as approachable. As they come up to me and say, you come to my school and do this. And I love your assemblies. And um, some have said, uh, I believe in what you talk about it in our assemblies, but I don't know what to do now. So for them, what's the next step? Yeah. Well, it may be the child would like to know more, but maybe their parents don't yet. So unless we bridge the gap to the school, the child might not come to us church ever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so it's about giving the child the opportunity to explore God or Jesus, or the Bible, in a context that is already familiar with, for them. Yeah, I understand. So what is the general vision for Actios moving forward? Um, well, I have two general visions. Um, one is that helping every child recognize that they can have a relationship with God now. I mean, my three, two, and one-year-old did. So, and they're... Yeah five years on or however many years on now and, and they even set you older. you on the right path too um, so if amazing. they can set yeah. me on the right path they can set their parents and their friends and whoever else um so their their relationship is not through anybody else but is direct um and church is bridging that gap to schools so it's not just all on one worker for example yeah 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 so on that point of, of one worker is there any plans to to get you some help with a colleague? There is. I know that we would love to have another worker, um, but the charity itself is not yet ready to take on another worker. Okay. I have suggested, however, to um, the ministers of churches of St. Neots, as the the organization, um, that Scripture Union is willing to train members of churches to be faith guides which are people who would have resources and training to go to a school and start like a holiday club where, or an afternoon club or a lunchtime club where you explore the Bible with a small group of children that are wanting more. Yeah, awesome. So that's something that's being made available that will, for volunteers widely? That is in the making in the sense that I'm helping to find a venue for that meeting to yeah. take place and for... Uh, people who are interested to come and find out more about what a faith guide is and how you go about being one. Yeah, excellent. So something for us all there, I think, in our private prayers and devotions, just to consider if this is something that God is calling us to, and then um, we'll be on standby to hear more from you about that in the, in the future. Does that, does that sound yeah. Yeah, about right? So... Um, I think we've got quite a lot of prayer fodder already, but particular things, what would you particularly like prayer for? Um, Wisdom and guidance in my relationships with schools, because there are so many, and uh, at the current moment, there's a lot of staff moving around in the schools, head teachers going, RE leads going, going on maternity, or just shifting different schools, and office staff that I speak to going to another school that has had historically a shut door um, that may be an opening but 
I can get overly committed really fast. So wisdom yeah. and guidance on how to keep relationships going, but also keeping in touch with those schools that maybe have an ongoing shut door. Yeah. Okay. May I pray for you now? Sure. Okay. Let's, let us all pray for Jennifer. Our Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for Jennifer and the, and the, the work of Atios. We give you thanks that she is there, so dedicated uh, to you and your service going into all of our local schools. We give you thanks for her children, Lord, who ask those deep questions that, that must surely have come from you. We give you thanks that through her children, she, has, she started her own um, faith journey that has led to all of this work. We give you thanks for the schools which open their doors widely, uh, widely for Jennifer and Atios. And we give you thanks for the relationships that have developed with them and with all of the children of those schools. Lord, we lift Jennifer to you now and everything that she carries. We pray particularly for um, the situation around time management. We pray for wisdom with Jennifer as she ministers in this way. We pray for the relationships between her and the children that she meets, that they continue to strengthen. We pray for more relationships between her and more children, Lord. We pray for the relationships between her and the schools that she is currently ministering in. We pray for your grace and wisdom to weave through Jennifer and her relationships with the teachers and administrators of those schools, Lord, that those relationships will continue to strengthen and deepen. We pray too for the schools that uh, are less keen or more nervous of this activity. We pray for the doors that are shut to be opened. Um, We pray for those doors to be open, Lord, and to stay open. We pray for your love and grace to shine through those closed doors into those schools. Um, So the the teachers um, and everybody involved in the management and leadership of those schools will see the benefit to having uh, Jennifer and Axios come in through the door, Lord. Lord, we pray for Axios, for the issues that we've heard of today. We pray for the situation to be such that uh, in, in the near future, a new volunteer, uh, a new person can start to be a colleague for Jennifer so that this, this work may... Um, may just rapidly increase, Lord. And we pray for the plans that we've heard of for the future, Lord, with rolling out a scheme to, to, to volunteers, Lord. We pray for your wisdom and grace just to weave through all of this, all of this, so that your will be done, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you very much. We'll continue to pray for you as a church. So thank you very much for coming today. I'm going to hand over to Julia, who's going to lead us in our prayers of intercession, and then we will have a Bible reading, and then Ray will come and speak to us. Thank you, Julia. Let us pray. Dear Lord, as we quieten ourselves to come into your presence, we want to give praise and thanks to you for allowing us and welcoming us into your holy sanctuary. We acknowledge that you are our refuge and our rock, and we bow to your awesome power and unrelenting love for us. You created us for your pleasure and to live in harmony with you and the world you created. May we never forget that a place in your family means service to you and those who need to see and know of your gospel, which is for all peoples and nations. You are Lord of the universe and all that is in it. As we meet this morning on Mission Sunday, we want to give special thanks to all those who serve you by going out into the world to share your story and to show your love through their discipleship to those who do not know you yet. This can sometimes mean putting themselves in danger and having to endure persecution. Please give these special people your strength through the Holy Spirit to persevere and trust in your protection. We also want to remember our mission partners at St. Mary's this morning, all of whom work tirelessly for you and for whom we give thanks. We pray for Alan and Litza McClymont, working for OMF in London. They ask for our prayers as they seek guidance as a family concerning where their future ministry lies. We pray for Mano in Sri Lanka as she prepares to return to England 
for a much needed rest from all the turmoil and political corruption in her country. We also remember Teresha and Israel at Triumph Heart in Uganda as they minister to their local communities, both spiritually and practically, helping young disabled children and their families overcome the great difficulties associated with being different in that country. We ask, Lord, that you give your strength and wisdom to these dedicated people out in the field and that they may know your joy and peace. We especially want to thank you this morning, Lord, for Jennifer and all those working for Actios as they share your name and a story to the children and families in St Neots. It is clear in the Gospels that little children are treasured by you and in their innocence and vulnerability are able to see and know you clearly. May Jennifer's work enrich the lives of the children in our schools and may she be able to have meaningful conversations with the parents and teachers of these children, spreading the love and joy that comes from knowing you. And finally, Lord, we are seeing great things happening in your name amongst the young people of this town. We are so grateful that the leaders of the church youth groups are working together to show our precious teenagers your ways and teachings through their love and care for them. We give thanks to Angela as she spearheads the youth cafes in St Neots, which so far have attracted over 75 unchurched children, several of whom are attending the New Day Youth Camp with us next month. We give thanks that we are able to run a Youth Alpha from September, to which we hope you will bring many of these young people. The youth of today are your future, Lord, and we thank and praise you that we are able to be part of their spiritual growth and to be able to watch your kingdom grow. Please protect the children of our town and enable us to bring them into the protection of your loving arms. We ask all these things, Lord, in accordance with your will and to the glory of your holy name. Amen. We will now say together the special prayer for today. Creator God, you made us all in your image. May we discern you in all that we see and serve you in all we do. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. As our Saviour taught us, so we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your hour be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. The Bible reading this morning is taken from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 6, verses 1 to 9, and can be found on page 185 of the Bible. These are the commands, decrees, and laws the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you are crossing the Jordan to possess, so that you, your children, and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all his decrees and commands that I give you and so that you enjoy long life. Hear, Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord your God and your ancestors promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses 
and on your gates. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. As we turn, O Father, to reflect upon your word, lead us by your spirit into your truth. In Jesus we pray. Amen. Well, it's good to have this opportunity to hear more about the work of Actios. Of course, Actios was really born from this church with David Miller starting it up all those years ago. But of course, the idea of children being in school is really a relatively modern thing in British society. It wasn't until 1870 with the Elementary Education Act that everybody had education. But for the Jews, it's been very different. Learning, education, has really been at the heart of the Jewish faith down the centuries. It's what's kept them together as a people. As through the millennia they've gone through so much suffering, so much trauma, dispersion into other nations, the one thing that has kept them together is that they were people who were learning, who were reciting the Word of God. In our reading today, we have the foundation text of what it means to be a Jew. In the verses that were read to us, in verse 4, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And of course, if you've got your Bibles open, you'll see the word Lord there in capital letters, which means that it stands for the revealed name of the God of Israel. We pronounce it as Yahweh nowadays. The Jews themselves don't like to express the name. The commandment, you shall not take the name of your Lord in vain, they feel it's better if you don't say it at all, because then you can't take it in vain. But this verse, with very few words in Hebrew, beginning with that word here, which in Hebrew is Shema. And this prayer is known as the Shema, said by Jews twice a day. And I thought it'd be a good idea if this morning we got a feel of what it's like to be a Jew who learns to say this prayer properly, these words properly as a confession. And so hopefully it will come up on the screen. Hi, I'm Rabbi Mike Eastein. This is Shema and the first paragraph of Ve'ahavta. Shema is the quintessential Jewish declaration of faith in God. It's traditionally said with the hands covering the eyes. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. The next line is said quietly, Baruch Shem Kivod Malchuto Leolam Ed. And then the next paragraph, the Vyahapta paragraph, which talks about the requirement of loving God, um, begins uh, as it is read in the same uh, manner that we read from the Torah. Vyahapta eight Adonai Elohecha. Right. Next week we'll start the Hebrew services. And um, you can all learn Hebrew this week so that we can worship as Jesus worshipped. No. So... 
where are we in the Bible? We're in the book of Deuteronomy, this wonderful book that puts to us Moses' last words to Israel before they entered the promised land, preparatory words. Unlike other nations who are identified by the land they live in, Israel is to be identified before they go into the land. We, of course, uh, people like to talk about the British as the island race, this sceptered isle, etc., etc. But for Israel, they needed to know who they were before they went into the land. Their identity is centered on their relationship with God. They're a nation that would not exist were it not that God had set his love on them. Their continual well-being as a nation would be seen in their faithfulness to God. Moses has just reminded them of those great events at Mount Sinai. That moment when God gave them what we know as the Ten Commandments, when they were shown the glory of the Lord and they heard the voice of God speaking to them from the mountain. Moses said to the people, you heard. But of course, the majority of those people, indeed, other than Moses and Joshua and Caleb, these were not the people who had heard. It was their fathers, that generation that had died in the wilderness. But Moses can say to them, this is what came to you, because you're part of this nation. What they heard, you are hearing. This is the same God. Your fathers met with the living God. This is your God. And Moses said, when they met with God, God gave them command. He gave them statutes and decrees. Things to be observed as part of Israel as they enter into the promised land, into the land of Canaan. They are a nation who are called to fear Yahweh, their God. He is a holy God, a God who makes demands on his people, a God who sets out the pattern of life for his people. This is to be central to their life as a nation. And Moses said they are to continue to teach this down the generations. They're to teach their children and their children's children. And so the people continue to be identified with the words of this God who has spoken to them. Moses is setting out facts about God. There's a lot of people today who actually don't like facts. They don't like living by facts. They are governed by their personal opinion or by their feelings. There are people who like trigger warnings if you're going to say anything that maybe might disturb them. Of course, one of the difficult things about the Bible is there aren't any trigger warnings. The Bible comes to us, the Word of God, which in the New Testament we're told is a sharp two-edged sword as the Spirit takes that word and speaks into our lives, convicting us, maybe, of our sins, directing us into what God's purposes are. But there are facts. It's not just a question of what we want to believe. We need to learn that this is a God who divines, defines himself and his relationship with us. We meet with God on his terms and not on our own. And so this daily statement of belief was central to God's revelation. Not for Israel, a general term for God. 
not a word like Baal, which meant Lord and was used in different religions at the time, but rather a specific name, this name that we articulate as Yahweh, those four Hebrew letters. But for us, of course, for us, if we are asked, who is your God? We will reply, yes, Yahweh is our God, the Father of our Lord, Jesus Christ. And if Jesus told us to call him Father, don't worry if the Archbishop of York told you to call him something else. Israel is told to fear Yahweh, to know him as the only God of Israel the one God, the unique God, the God that we are to fear and obey. But our text goes further, as that Hebrew text went further. Not only are we called to fear and obey him, we are also called to love him. And some some of you may wonder at this trio of commands, fear, obey, love. But at least the last two you may not find as so incongruous as perhaps it seems. Because Jesus says to us, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Fear and obedience help us to understand the sort of love we are talking about. It's a demand for a total, exclusive commitment The word love that's used here is not the regular Hebrew word that you might use in any sort of loving relationship, but it's a word that speaks of covenant love, that great bond based on the promises of God in bringing Israel to be his people. We are to love him with our heart, the center of emotions and thought. Jesus, when he translated this word in what we know as the first commandment, he said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind. Translating by two Greek words, one Hebrew word. We should love him with all our soul. Nefesh, the Hebrew word there, refers to our total being, our total personality. And we should love him with all our strength, all our outward activities, our possessions, our areas of influence. The hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross, in its last verse, has this conception. All that we have belongs to our God, and we are committed to him. It's not primarily speaking of emotion, but it is speaking of relationship, that we are called into a covenant relationship with the God of the universe. What a privilege this is. How wonderful it is that we can know God that we can love him, that our lives can be devoted to him. And for Israel, this central truth was to be kept in mind day by day and to be passed on to the other oncoming generations. The Torah, the law of God, was central to Israel's life. Later on in the book of Deuteronomy, Moses will say that when Israel has a king, the king should write out the law for himself. I wonder what it would be like if our politicians had to write out the law of God when they come into office. It might transform society. But it was not only the king that was to keep remembering what God has said. One of the remarkable things that seems to be more and more a consensus is that the alphabet for writing originated about the time when God gave the law to the Jewish people. 
about that period when Israel were coming out of Egypt, starting amongst the Semitic languages. Before that, you had to be a scholar to be able to read. You had to be able to remember the hieroglyphs of Egypt or the cuneiforms of Babylon. But with the beginnings of what we know as the alphabet, writing, reading, became open to all people. It was something people could learn. Israel was to learn the words of God. And they were to have verbal and visible reminders of who they were as the people of Yahweh. They were to talk about God in their houses, when they were out walking, when they got up, when they go to bed. That's why the Shema is said by Jews when they get up and when they go to bed, reminding them continually. We rejoice today in the work of Actios in telling children in the schools about our God. But do we personally tell children in our families about the nature of our God? about what it means to be in a relationship with the God of the universe in Jesus Christ? Is he part of our conversation day by day? Do we even talk about our faith when we meet together over coffee at the ends of the service? Or do we just chatter about our own daily lives? Do we seek to learn from one another what it means to live as a Christian. The Israelites were going to enter the land of Canaan, where they would meet the followers of other faiths. They found it hard to maintain this unusual belief, a God for whom there was no image, an invisible God, and a God who was only one. We live in a culture that bombards us from every side with false ideas about life, about morality, about belief. What are we doing to maintain our belief in the God revealed in Scripture? Are we spending time each day learning about this God from the Scriptures? I haven't got time to go around and ask each of you what you do about your daily Bible reading. But you can ask yourself, how much of the Scriptures becomes part of our life day by day? Are our ideas and our concepts being shaped by Scripture or by what we see on the television? One of the responses to the Archbishop of York's remarks about people having a difficulty in believing as God as Father was, I think it was a letter in the Telegraph from a woman who said that she'd had a bad father. But when she came into a belief in Jesus, she did not doubt the fatherhood of God. Rather, it drove her to the Scriptures where she learned about God as Father. And it gave her an understanding of what it means to, be, to have a Father that had never been part of her life before. There was a Bangladeshi woman many years ago, Bilkis Sheikh, who when she was converted said, I dared to call him Father. That great discovery through Scripture of what, the, what it is to have a Father who cares for us. An unconcept of the fatherhood of God that isn't defined by our own experiences, but by the Scriptures. And if we have that understanding, then those of us who are fathers have a correction to our own life and behavior. Because God is a father, and we are to be imitators of him 
rather than our idea of God being imitators of our own experience. Are we doing anything to ensure that when we are faced with contrary views or temptations, we have scripture ready to refute them? When Jesus was tempted, those three temptations in the wilderness, how did he reply? He replied to each temptation with a verse from Deuteronomy. Jesus knew his scriptures. He'd been brought up as a Jewish boy. He had learnt the scriptures and he remembered them. Do we have passages of scripture in our memory? Now it has to be confessed that nowadays it's rather more difficult to memorize scripture than it used to be. When I was a child, there was only one version of the, of the scriptures, the authorized version, the King James version. And some of you may have noted that if ever I quote a text off the top of my head, it's likely to be the King James version, because that's what I had when I was young. That's where I memorized scripture. Today, there's this plethora of verses, uh, versions and... Um, Modern translations are not so easy often to memorize. I was at a conference a couple of weeks ago, and one of the speakers was saying how difficult he found it to decide which version of the scriptures to memorize. And so he decided to memorize the Hebrew text. Well, that was all right for him. But for most of us, that would be rather difficult. But is there any way that the scripture is becoming part of us? C.H. Spurgeon, that great preacher of the 19th century, he spoke about John Bunyan, the, you know, the local boy in Bedford, where you go and get your pots prepared, um, that his blood ran bibline, that scripture was so much part of him. Is scripture part of us? Do we know the scriptures? And Israel had visible reminders in the phylacteries they were to wear and the signs that would be put on their houses. Now, this could become something that just became a proclamation of how religious they were. Jesus criticized the Pharisees for that. But they were visible signs. We have the two authorized visible signs of Holy Communion and Baptism, two signs that bring to us the centrality of the cross of Christ in our, in our life, in our faith. Years ago, people used to have Bible texts scattered around their houses. Some of them weren't just Bible texts. There was, Thou God seest me. And God, the silent listener to every conversation, which weren't exactly very encouraging. But there were others who had the Lord is my shepherd. Or for God so loved the world. Or other texts. Now maybe we don't want to do that today. But here is the challenge, I believe, of our passage today. What are we doing? to ensure that Scripture is central to our life day by day. What are we doing to protect ourselves from the world around because we know what God has said and we are living as those who are God's people in this world? May that be our experience. Amen. Thank you, Ray. As we come to our time of confession, it may be that some of the things that Ray talked about um, will be on, on your hearts. So let us just take a moment to, to think about the things that we should bring before the Lord, the things that we could have done differently, shouldn't have done at all, or should have done better. I'll just hold a time of silence for us to privately reflect.
to the words that we that I will say and the responses should be on the screen. Let us pray. In a dark and disfigured world, we have not held out the light of life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. In a hungry and despairing world, we have failed to share our bread. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. In a cold and loveless world, we have kept the love of God to ourselves. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May the God who loved the world so much that he sent his son to be our saviour, forgive us our sins and make us holy to serve him in the world through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. So now we stand, if we're able to sing our final song, during which there'll be a collection. To God be the glory. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. There are refreshments at the back for us to all enjoy, so I hope to see many of you um, 
after the service and get to talk to many of you. Please do keep Jennifer and Actios in your prayers as we move forward in the time ahead. It's such a, such a great ministry. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you and remain with you always. Amen. Amen. Thanks, everybody.